Good morning. Good morning. Let's talk about web platform tests. Um, small point about terminology first. Um, intro, that means interoperability. And usually, or traditionally, that means two things interoperating. Like in the IETF sense of the word, that's two things like a server and a client working together. On the web platform, though, we usually mean it's, mean it's the, that it's um, two things that react the same way to the same input. So it's more like interchangeable. Um, but let's go with intro. Um, first of all, why, why do we care and why, why should we care? Um, these are different questions. Let me just uh, reflect on that for a bit. Um, so why do I care? This is, this is me in my teenage years. This is my, um, my first book in Swedish about HTML. It talks about HTML4 as a thing of the future. That was in the days of uh, IE4 and Netscape Core. Before long, there was IE6. So the web was kind of my first programming language. I didn't have an uh, Atari or an Amiga or any of that. I just wrote some JavaScript with formal controls and that kind of thing. But that was my first kind of programming. And I built little toys like this game where you shoot bunnies uh, and they, they go splat. Um, so I, I just loved playing with the web. About 10 years later, I was working for Apple Software. Uh, I worked on the Presto, Presto engine, which was powering Opera from the, well, basically the, the beginning of Opera 12. Um, this is me together with Paul Conville Lee, the CTO of Opera and the inventor of CSS. And I was demoing um, support for WebM um, that I added to, to Opera. About five years, I realized it's about five years since my, my last commit to Presto. Um, Presto. Presto died. Opera started using Chromium instead. And well, Opera, the browser is around, but um, Presto, the render, rendering engine, it's, it's, it's dead. Um, so I kind of thought that the web was invincible, the web would always win, um, that the number of rendering engines couldn't possibly decrease. Um, but I was wrong. It is possible to decrease from five to four, and maybe more. Um, so that's that's why I care. Um, so I love the web, and I learned that uh, it's not invincible. But I could have told you a story about Scheme and my love for a particular Scheme dialect, um, and how I'm sad that it's gone. You probably wouldn't care. So <coughs> why should we care? Well, the web platform is the only platform that can do this. Um, the web platform has ubiquitous reach. Um, any new device on the screen basically has, has the web. Um, these are four browser engines over five different uh, devices. And the web seems to be the only platform with this kind of reach, which has no single point of control and no single point of failure. Um, and I think that's very powerful. But um, web developers aren't as impressed as, as we are, perhaps. Um, I was going to reuse an old slide about web developer outrage, but I thought it would be so easy to just find some new ones. So I went out on Twitter and found some from just a few days ago. So day in, day out for the past 15, 20 years or so, this has been the life of, of web developers. Stuff just doesn't work. Um, they love the web, they're trying to make it work, but it's just so much time spent fighting the platform. So that's why I think we should care. Um, the cost and difficulty of building for the web matters. Um, this is kind of the, the health of the web ecosystem isn't guaranteed. So what, what, is, what is the problem? Is, are all platforms terrible like this? Is this just inevitable because there are currently four implementations of the web platform? Um, well, some tension is probably inevitable, um, but a lot of this is, is really kind of pointless. Um, so we are kind of used to thinking of our own browsers as a product. I'm going to ship a new thing in Firefox, or I'm going to ship a new thing in, 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 in Chrome. But web developers, they want a cohesive web platform. As far as possible, they just want to write for the web platform and have it just work. 
So to web developers, it's kind of like the, the web pattern is the product. Um, so let's try to think about that as our product. But this product doesn't have a product manager, and it, and it can't have a product manager, at least not a single one. Um, however, addressing it like this, this seems to be like a neglected, um, neglected way of thinking. So it should be pretty easy to make to make progress. So if we think of the web platform as a product, so like a, a single software engineering project, and try to apply some basic software engineering uh, lessons, what, what do we get? Uh, so that brings us down to the, the point of this talk, web pattern test. Um, so one year ago, this is what web pattern test looked like. It was already pretty old, as you can tell from the commit count. It's been around since 2013 or 2010, or older depending on what you count as the origin. Um, one year ago, it wasn't anyone's primary test suite. Um, using web pattern test was harder than not using it. I mean, if you're writing a change in, in Gecko or Chromium, it's actually just way easier to, um, to, uh, to write your tests uh, in that internal repository. Web pattern test, the product itself, had no continuous integration. So if you change things, you don't really know how they're affecting the test suite. No dashboard, so you can see how the overall health is. And in large parts, not in great shape. I was thinking with the specs because no one, wasn't anyone's job at all to, to keep what happened test in good shape. So let's fix all of these problems. Uh, let's see where we are so far. So the first thing we went about doing uh, is building a two-way sync between Chromium and what happened tests. So WebKit and and Chromium once worked from probably once worked from WebKit had scripts to import from Web Pattern Test, but nothing to, to export the changes. Um, Gecko, however, had had a, a, a system for exporting the changes for a while that that's, uh, was manual. And we wanted to, to make this uh, an automatic process so that people could forget about the fact that Web Pattern Test is not uh, the same repository as this Chromium and just write their tests and have it just work. Um, so, basic, basic story is just every commit in, in what happened test gets copied over to Chromium and vice versa. So it's pretty simple in, in principle. Uh, of course, both Chromium and what happened test has, has their, or now they do, um, their continuous integration checks, so things can go wrong. Um, but in any case, where we are now is that um, changes in WPT are imported into Chromium in 12 hours or so and Chromium changes are exported in an hour. Uh, humans aren't in the loop, this is all automatic, but it is always possible for this to go wrong because to make it flawless, you would have to basically merge your repositories or have cross repo atomic commits, and that wasn't really on the table. Um, so uh, when things go wrong, there are humans on rotation to, to pick this up, but as it turns out, because of the frequency of import and export, this doesn't happen a lot. So it's actually working very well in practice. Here's, here's the way it works, uh, just a demo with, with export. This is a change from a few days ago. Someone was uh, moving some, some tests within the Chromium tree from one directory to another uh, to have those show up in the pattern test. And uh, Magic Machines uh, created this PR uh, waiting for the uh, tests to run and then merged automatically within a few hours. So about those tests, um, any, any serious software engineering product needs continuous integration. And uh, as I said, Web Pattern Test did not. So that's one thing we've done in the last year. Um, this, um, this little thing here, the build past, that is uh, reporting on the results of Travis Jobs. Um, all it does right now is to notice if tests are unstable when it so reject the, the or fail, fail the build. Uh, it doesn't care whether the tests are passing or failing as long as they're consistently doing so. Um, so that's where, where we are with that, and that does catch uh, it. 
does stop us from adding more flaky tests um, to the repo, which has been a, a major problem. We also built a dashboard. This is WPT.FYI. Um, it's uh, pretty much what you would expect. All the tests are running all, all these four browsers um, every day. And you can drill down into to the results, individual tests, and see why they're failing. Um, and there are some numbers here that we'll get back to what they're supposed to be in and uh, how they're going to change. Um, based on full runs of the, of the uh, test suite, some, some parts of the, the test suite has been improved, or the password has been improved in, in Chromium. The, the domain HTML team in Blink has particularly invested a lot. And you can see that it is possible to, to do way better than we have been doing and, and improve the quality of, of, of the tests or the implementation. So when we go from zero to 90 percent, uh, just might be a problem with the test, right? Or maybe there was one little boring thing that was fixed and that got us from zero to, I don't know, 89. Um, so this doesn't, so these numbers, they mean different things. Um, but as we keep improving them, getting closer to 100, the stuff that's failing is, is going to be more, more, more and more interesting and, and more worth paying attention to. <coughs> So, in addition to making web platform test first class in, in, in the browser engines, Chromium, and so on, um, we also have a problem of standards. Um, so, oh, about a year ago as well, October 3rd, um, we picked up on an idea that had been kind of floating around for a while that, hey, wouldn't it be a good idea if when we change the spec, we also change the test for it? Um, so we, we took, so this is in the, in the working group. So we started by applying this idea to the HTML, which is the biggest uh, uh, web page pack. And um, as it turns out, we, we didn't say we require tests. We just say, it would be nice if you wrote tests, or if you don't explain why it's hard. Um, and just by doing that, um, the results were um, far beyond what we would have expected. I wrote up kind of a summary of how that went in this blog post. It's linked from the, um, uh, from this, from the slide notes. Um, so given that success in HTML, we decided to expand that to, to all of the public specs. And that is just my default uh, working mode uh, in the web working group. And find some really funny, funny cases here in the in the first part of the blog post where the spec had changed and then ten years passed and no one noticed. But then Butka did notice and changed it, but then had to change it back just because we're doing so badly at, at communicating our changes with tests. Uh, so that's now much much better. Um, building on that. Success. We went about uh, trying to convince others to do it as well. Uh, and uh, in the past year, about 80, 80 plus specs are have some kind of policy asking for specs or saying you must write, or asking for tests, or you, you must write tests, or maybe it's a good idea, something of that, of that shape. Um, so, so recently, all of all of the CSS and the SVG stuff is um, has a policy like this. Or, well, the, just for the CR and all the respects, but anyway. And there are about, I, I try to count how many specs there are, which is a bit fuzzy, but I, I estimate there's about 100 uh, that matter um, to go. Um, here's a little bonus slide that doesn't have to do with web platform tests, but is a thing that my team um, has done. Um, this is the API Confluence dashboard. So confidence means coming together. So it's all about how to kind of visualizing how the how the web platform is is either growing together or, or growing apart as it may be. Um, and it does this by 
looking at what things you can find on the window object in all browsers, all versions of browsers, going back as far as, as we could, and then doing also some time-based metrics, um, where this is a case where if Chrome removed the thing, and then a year later, everyone else that had it, that, that would show up in, in this graph. Um, so you can play with that a bit if, if, if you want to see that. Um, Okay, back to web platform tests. Um, what are we up to next? Well, automation is a huge problem. There are lots of manual tests in web platform tests. Uh, a lot of those I haven't counted, but I suspect that the majority of them just want to click a thing uh, to bypass the user, what's it called? Activation now, I think is the terminology. Um, like full screen, for example, you just need to click anywhere to run your tests, and that's all. Um, and as it turns out, web developers also want to automate this stuff. And they've been using WebDriver, usually wrapped in Selenium, uh, to do this for, for a long time. And web platform tests is already, the te individual tests are already started by WebDriver. So we're just making it so that the test itself can ask WebDriver to click itself, um, and then be able to automate all of these tests. So beyond basic inputs, like mouse, keyboard, um, touch, pointer events, um, we're also going to do permissions, and then some WebRTC related things, uh, like mock media at some point. So, I mean, manual tests, I don't know if you noticed, but manual tests are kind of useless. Uh, they can show up in this dashboard, um, and to even know the regression as well, you know. Manual tests are better than no tests, but just barely so. We're also doing more of the continuous integration uh, on, um, on GitHub. As I said, the current Travis tooling we have there only cares about flakiness. Um, but maybe you want to care about regressions too. Like, if there was a test that was passing in Firefox, and then someone in Chrome wanted to do a thing per the spec that seemed reasonable, and then it turns out that makes a test fail in Firefox. Well, at the very least, you want to investigate why. That's, that can't be blocking, but you should understand why it is. So this is just a, a mock-up I made up of how that might look. Just say, hey, something's not perfect here. Take a look. Um, so that what that means is we don't have to run the test with the changes and without the changes, of course, for all the browsers, whereas currently we're just running them with, with the changes. That's going to happen this quarter. Um, when I showed the dashboard before you, maybe you got a bit nervous about the numbers there and the presentation. Um, many people are nervous about the kind of gamification risks of, of what happened in the past. Because there have been quite a few uh, negative experiences with I think it's a particular performance benchmarks that have kind of created perverse incentives for for the um, for ECMAScript engines, and have kind of caused implementations to overfit for benchmarks and do stuff that's not actually in the best interest of of, of the web platform. Um, and there is a similar risk with uh, with platform tests if, if the dashboard is kind of gets popular enough. So we're going to change the default presentation. There's a noise. We're going to change the default presentation to something that, um, where the incentives are always pointing in the right in the direction of interop. Um, by well, this is a, this is my, this is kind of just an idea. At the very least, we should know what what are the number of tests that are passing everywhere, and then have reports per browser saying these are the tests you could fix that are only fitting for you that would increase that number. Um, and then we're also investigating, since we're running the, the dashboard daily, after a year or so, we could probably do some interesting time-based metrics where we can see how different directories are getting better or worse over time uh, and have that influence uh, priority as well. There we go. Yes, and we're also doing more um, pushing on the standards front. Um, as I said, we've done 80 specs already. We're modestly, so the goals we had set 
previous quarters were kind of modest, let's do five or let's do 10. And in each case, we kind of oversight it by, by a lot. Um, so this, this quarter, we're trying to have 15, and we'll see. We should expect it to get, to get harder and harder, because so the strategy, um, the strategy with, with the kind of testing policy was always to first start with the easy, easy things, or the, where the editors will be most willing and most sympathetic to you. Um, and then when you go to the next easiest thing, point back to the previous success and make it look like there's a momentum. And my hypothesis is that there is a tipping point of sorts. Um, and if we reach this tipping point, then it'll simply become expected of everyone to take testing seriously when they write tests. And at that point, I think that will be kind of irreversible. If you imagine code review culture, and you take a big software project and you do code review, just kind of part of the day-to-day -day workflow and as part of the tooling, it would take some kind of cataclysmic event to undo the code review culture of that project. And I think the same is going to be true um, for testing, for writing tests with your, your specs once we reach that tipping point. Um, that tipping point should be soon enough. Maybe it's here, maybe Maybe a T pack, I don't know. Um, but in any case, to figure out what the next most uh, actionable things were, I uh, I wrote this little thing uh, where for each spec there are two lines of boxes. Each box is a day, and green means something happened in that, their post story that day. So if you sort in different ways, you can find kind of outliers. Like web audio here seems to be. I know some of this is actually busy work and just fiddling with the ideal, but anyway, when you see things like that, you should be uh, you should wonder maybe that's a, a case we could uh, look at next. So, we're going to keep working on, on pushing on that until we reach that tipping point. Also, um, to take to take web platform tests more seriously. Um, we're going to make it our default test suite. We have to triage new failures. So we'll be working on, in the first instance, to, to automatically file bugs when we import new failures uh, from web platform tests. And to enable that for the teams who think that seems like a good idea. Um, you can imagine this is going to be pretty noisy. We're not going to do it for everything at once. Um, but what well, pattern test has been used as, as mostly as a regression test suite, and that's not good enough. Um, we need to also take failures seriously, and uh, I mean failures that come from the outside and not the ones we cause ourselves. We need to take those seriously and make sure that our scores, our pass rates are always uh, improving. So, also if you want people to use web pattern tests by default, then one kind of obvious way of doing it is just deleting layout tests. Um, if there is basically no alternative to web pattern test, and that's what people will do. Um, so this is going to be a bit of a project. Um, there are about 70,000 files in layout tests, 60,000 in uh, web pattern tests. So move all of those somehow. Um, <laughs> Smobs just move. Uh, there are shared challenges there. There's lots of test suites that exist in both places that have been imported and forked over time. There's going to be lots of overlap. There's going to be lots of tests that don't actually match what the specs say anymore. <coughs> this kind of thing. Um, but I think we can, we can take a big bite out of that. Um, and um, I think there's a particularly interesting thing with a test that we share from, from WebKit. Uh, the thing that could go badly. So imagine we just we just succeed in moving all, in moving all our tests, but then WebKit still has all of those tests, and they are left with a headache of uh, okay, which ones, which of our tests are we supposed to keep? So I think some amount of coordination is going to be necessary there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, Success is not guaranteed, and you can't relax. Um, help! So, please use web platform tests and other 
the web pattern test isn't the only thing in the world. There's also test 262 and, and WASM and uh, WebGL. Anyway, write shared tests uh, as far as possible. And then let us know when that's not possible, and uh, we should try to fix that. And most important of all at this point in time, I think, is uh, two-way sync everywhere. If we have two-way sync everywhere, I think that's going to be a bit of a game changer because that will decrease the, the, the feedback loop by a lot. So currently, it might maybe be a matter of weeks, months, years before an idea from, from one corner of the ecosystem reaches all the other corners. Uh, and that seems like something we could fix. Um, so, Gecko is, is implementing a faster automatic two-way sync. Edge, I don't know. WebKit, you won. Uh, <laughs> this just seems like a super important thing uh, that needs to happen. Um, yeah. And then we can fix this platform. We can do it. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. You want? Yeah, I have some questions, but before just to say that uh, I agree with uh, your principle uh, for fetch. Uh, we did that on my kit, we worked the week to first. And it's just great because whenever the state change, there's a test which change, there's a break in my kit, and we get it notified because there's a black web kit all over, and it's fine, like a stack editor. And we can sync very quickly, very efficiently without actually tracking the stack. It's just perfect, it's very nice. Um, on the website side, we do not have uh, these magical tools, uh, maybe one day. We still have HTTP slash WPT, which allows you to write tests run uh, behind the WPT server. So uh, that's the first path toward actually uh, running tests as if they were web platform tests. So I would encourage you to try it. Um, it's Quite common, it stays in WebKit, so you do not have to actually export them to GitHub um, before submitting them into WebKit. So you should really try it and see whether that was working for you. Um, related to your idea that Chromium should upstream everything to web platform tests, I'm not against it, but um, at the same time, sometimes we write tests uh, which are not related to conformance. That which are related to a particular aspect of um, our own browser. And if we assume it, then we no longer have control on it, and some, somehow the stack will change. And then uh, some other guy will say, hey, let's change a little bit this test, but it's dead on king, or it will cover something else, and then we will no longer have that. Yeah. So yeah. there are some issues like that. Um, yeah, I don't think we can do all of them, but maybe, maybe 90%. Um, <laughs> And um, I think we could do tooling like try to run all the tests and see which ones are already passing everywhere. Do this first. Um, yeah. And well, this is it's it's going to be hard, I think, but it's not going to be that hard because no one's tried before. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. um, how about two-way sync? Um, so th there's there's a patch on WebKit.org which allows you uh, to run. Uh, so you have a patch on the web log and it will um, create a PR and send it to GitHub. It's, it was working like six months ago and I stopped working on it for other stuff. Um, I have an idea for an ActPass project. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe we could, we, could, we could try that. Definitely it would be uh, very cool to at least have just a trust script that allows any web working contributor to just create a PR very easily. Uh, then we would need to integrate it into blackwebby.org and our bots, uh, which would be a, a more a bigger task, but that's that's my goal at some point. Yeah. yeah. Um. Okay. Um, yes. If you have a question. So I think one of the artists uh, artist start with us. Loader, please. No. I think one of the hardest part, parts of the test in WPT are stuff that, uh, for example, that reacts to mouse and like, like all 
the state changes that there's so many like if there's one way to test per browser, is there any plan to like address it or like some Yeah, so that's the uh, automation slide, let's see. So this is about automating first all kinds of inputs. Um, first just first just clicking and then mouse and then keyboard and then touch events and then pointer events. Um, all of those are all already exist in WebDriver. So it, sh it should just be a simple matter of, of wrapping that. And that I think you can expect in, so the clicking is going to be done in two weeks. Um, the rest uh, sometimes, well, keyboard also this quarter. Um, pointer events also this quarter. Um, I'm, I can't promise about everything else, whatever that is. Um, but lots of stuff this quarter. Um, yeah, any other kind of um, automation that you're thinking about? I, I think, I, I don't know how you say this, but it's sort of like long time wasting. And I don't know if you have resources or Josh to write it. <laughs> so, uh, how reusable are all this kind of uh, automation that they're building for Chromium or WebKit? Or, because right now I think each one is writing their own. Yeah. And it would be nice to just. So, 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 so some of the problems in classes are we have Python and are reusable. I use it use some of it for the lack of information. Um I think we should have maybe a breakout session. Maybe yeah, we want to talk sure. about this should uh, talk about this. Yeah, we have in the wiki several topics and one of them is web platform tests and we can discuss there and and plan. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you very much.